much, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks to Express Glass, and uh, equally thanks to Chris and the team here for the opportunity this afternoon. Uh, a bit like yourself. Um, thank you for that, Jonathan. I am, my mind, I've got to focus on this, but my mind is thinking about my Facebook, my LinkedIn, uh, my email, my, my passwords and everything else. So I'm going to go hard and fast for about 30 minutes and then uh, rush off so I can do all the things that I now need to do, uh, having been prompted by Jonathan. And I'd like to start just by giving you two or three of the, my absolute um, top tips from my, my life in, in corporate and beyond. And um, my first one would be this, and this is a story I heard um, 20 odd years ago when I was starting out in my corporate career. And I went to an event like this, and this speaker took the stage and he told this story. And he said, um, there was a conference in New York and they got the top 100 people together from this particular industry. And they asked the number one person to go on stage and share all of her secrets with the other 99. And she did that. She shared absolutely everything that she had. And when she came off stage, a journalist grabbed her and said, are you mad? You've just shared all of your secrets with everyone else. And she said, it doesn't matter. I'll still be number one next year. And the journalist goes, how can you be so sure? And she goes, well, 50% of the people weren't really listening. And out of the other 50%, only three or four have got the strength of personality to change their behaviors in any way. I will still be number one next year. And the story played out that she was number one, but yet by an even greater distance. And when I heard that, first of all, I was a little bit disappointed, but then I made a decision that whenever I saw anyone doing anything better than me, I'd learn what it was, I would copy it, and I'd, then I'd add my own 10% winning edge. I'd learn it, I'd copy it, I'd add my own 10% winning edge. And I truly believe I built a, a, you know, a really great corporate career out of that and a few other things alone. It wasn't just looking within my industry, it was looking across any industry and any opportunity. Wherever I saw anyone doing anything better, learn it, copy it, and add 10% winning edge. So that'd be my first. My second one would be, you know, in my office, when I had an office, I just had three big words plastered on the wall. Clarity, consistency, and simplicity. Now I have the pleasure of working with a, a lot of amazing businesses, normally at the leadership team level, and then I go to the front end of the business. I go and talk to the assistant property managers or whoever else it might be, depending on the industry. And uh, at leadership level, I'll say to them, is there absolute clarity in this business? Does everyone know what matters most? And then I'll go and talk to the, the front end of the business, those who are closest to the clients, and I'll go around individually saying, tell me the three most important things in this business. I used to do it when I was running the bank. You know, I used to go into my branches when the bank manager wasn't there, and I'd, I'd talk to people individually saying, tell me the three most important things in this branch. Tell me the three most important things in this branch. Tell me the three most important things in this branch. Hardly ever was the consistency of the three most important things. You know, and I'm a fundamental believer that to run a really, really successful business, you have to have clarity. You know, I believe clarity is a great motivator, but I believe ambiguity is a great demotivator. And uh, this is my first rule of, of communication. If I was to say to you, Franz Klammer's career is going downhill fast. Those of you who can remember Franz Klammer will know I'm talking about the Aust Aust Austrian, I nearly said Australian, um, the Austrian downhill skiing, uh, Olympic skiing champion from 1976. Those of you who've never heard of Franz Klammer will think I'm talking about a failing business person. Franz Klammer's career is going downhill fast. And again, I'll see a business owner, I'll see a business leader, and they go, I can't understand this. I've given all of my people the same message, and yet they're going off in different directions. What's wrong with them? And I'll say communication is not what you say, it's what they hear. And even more important, it's what they perceive from what they hear. You know, Franz Klammer's career is going downhill fast. You know, clarity, consistency. If you say one week this is important, the next week that's important, the following week something else is important. If everything's important, nothing's important. So you've got to have clarity and you've got to have consistency. And then, you know, you've got to make the complex simple and the simple compelling. So learn, copy, and add 10%. Clarity, consistency, and simplicity. And my third golden rule in, in business is this, that I've got the see it, say it, sort it. You know, and, and I see the exact opposite of that. So many people in so many businesses, they know how to improve the business. But the last thing they do is ever say it, because they believe no one listens. 
And if you can create a culture where when people see something, they're willing to say it and then you can sort it, you can accelerate your business at incredible pace. The amount of frustrated people in businesses who just don't bother because they don't think anything's going to change and they don't think anyone's going to listen is actually quite frightening. And my final one would be this, you know, and this is a coaching model that I, I, I love to use at a, at a personal level, at a team level, and at a business level. And I, and I guarantee if you took this back into your business and, and you involved the passionate people within your business to help you with this, your business would move forward. And it would go like this. If you just think of the word PIP, P-I-P, you know, and if I take it to an individual conversation, and, and this can be for really top performing businesses and individuals. And most coaching conversations are actually not coaching conversations. One person speaking to another person, your performance isn't very good. If I'm attacking you in that way, you've got two choices. You defend. When you defend, you don't say a lot. It's not a great basis for a coaching conversation. Or you attack me back. Your performance isn't very good. That's because you haven't supported me. Yes, I have. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. No, you haven't. You know, that's called a lose-lose conversation. If you just flip that around and say to someone, well, I can see great potential in you. However, I'm sure we both agree your current performance doesn't that ma match that potential. There must be something getting in the way. Let's call it interference. And then we focus on the interference. And, and then we're talking about what's stopping you as opposed to you as an individual. You know, and you can do that at a personal level. You can do that at a team level. You can do that at a business level. The potential of the business isn't matching the performance of the business because there's something in the middle getting in the way which we're going to call interference. And we're going to talk about what is stopping you. To take that kind of model to its conclusion, once we've got that list of interference, and I guarantee, even in the, the uh, and uh, I have to say, one of my clients is, um, is SSKB up in, in Queensland and spent some amazing time in that business. My respect for property managers and assistant property managers after sp spending some, si some time on the inside of your business is kind of through the roof. I mean, I used to work in banking and, and I used to think we used to get a tough time, but, but wow, um, you know, you don't often receive a happy phone call uh, in that type of environment. So huge respect to anyone in the room who does that uh, as a job. Um, but you'd list this whole, whole, whole series of interferences. And then I literally get the clients to go through. There's two types of interference, the stuff you can influence and the stuff that interferes with, with your success, but it's outside your control. When I used to run the bank, you know, my, my, I used to go to my branches and they used to say, the CBA down the road has just had a $2 million refurbishment. And I say, what can we do about that? Suncorp just released a term deposit paying this. I say, what can we do about that? Let's talk about the stuff we can influence. And I find the amount of time that's lost in Australian business talking about stuff that concerns us over which we've got no influence is significant. So even if you just stop that and get your people focused on what they can influence, your business and your performance will accelerate. But list down all the interference over which we've got an influence. And then, you know, when I was in the bank, no one in my team could ever come to me with a problem. No one in my team could ever come to me with a problem. That's come to me with one problem and two solutions they thought about for themselves. You know, and I found that if I was the only problem solver in the business, A, I could never take a day's holiday. But secondly, if five members of my team came to me on the same day with a problem, then I had a massive problem. And I knew my job was to build confidence, build capability, build decision making, you know, and, and, and encourage people to think about things for themselves. So what's interfering with your success? Out of that interference, what can you influence? And then how can you get your people to find solutions for themselves? So have you, oh, they've all gone. I can carry on talking without slides. Yeah, it was. <coughs> yeah. Understand how you're feeling. By the way, I'm I'm a I'm a Paul Manor Queenslander, Kim. So, I'm I'm feeling. Thank you. Which one? That one. That yeah, yeah, answer? perfect. Um, so very very quickly, uh, who am I? And and I'll go very quickly. Uh, as Mark said, I spent 30 years in financial services, 20 years in the United Kingdom. And uh, then I was made redundant at the height of the GFC. Uh, and I believe there's opportunity in everything. There's absolutely op opportunity in adversity. Best thing that ever happened to me, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have moved to Australia. 
uh, with my uh, amazing wife, Leona, and three quarters of my children. I then had the, the privilege and the pleasure of working for the Westpac Group uh, for eight years or so. Uh, the highlight of my corporate career was when I had the, the absolute privilege of running the St. George Retail Bank for three and a half years. Uh, I love that bank. I, lo I love, you know, they're focused on their people, they're focused on their customers, they're focused on the communities in which they operate. Uh, and then I moved back to Westpac. Now in my professional career, I always say to people, it's really, really important. Don't chase the job title. Don't chase the dollars. T uh, chase the culture. Chase, you know, working for an amazing leader. I didn't do any of that. Uh, so I moved back to Westpac, uh, and within 12 months, I decided it was time uh, to go and, uh, and run my own business. The photo on the top right is me on my 50th birthday, a defining moment in my life uh, when I, I took the Tony Robbins test. And that is the fact that uh, you just see yourself now, you're 85 years old, you're sitting in your rocking chair, you're looking back on your life. And do you want to be one of those people who goes, and Chris and I had this conversation very briefly over lunch, you know, I, I, I wish I, I had done that, I could have done that, I should have done that, I had the ability to do the other. Or do you want to be one of those people who looks back on your life, goes, well, I didn't get everything right, but I lived life true to my potential and I gave everything a best, my best shot. And I'm a fundamental believer that most people settle into a pattern you know, they get to a certain age, they go, well, I've got a partner, I've got a dog, I've got a couple of kids, I've got a big home loan, my life is set. And I believe you can disrupt yourself at any moment, if you so wish. Most people just choose not to. Uh, so that was a significant day for me. I could spend half an hour just talking about that day, but uh, that, we'll save that for another occasion. But I was gifted two books on that day, uh, which were really, really powerful books. And uh, if you're not a great reader, just go and um, Google these people, watch a couple of them speaking or listen to their podcasts. Uh, one was a book by a guy called John O'Leary called On Fire, and it talks about living a life of which balances success with, with significance. It's an absolutely fantastic read. And the second one was a book called um, uh, The Morning Miracle by a guy called Hal Elrod. And um, it's got a series of, of processes that you follow on a, on a daily basis each and every morning that gets you into the peak performance state. And um, it's an absolutely uh, simple but brilliant read, and it's a transformational process that has, has enabled me, I believe, to, to take myself to the optimal performance state on a daily basis. And uh, the third photo, and every time I do leadership training, by the end of the one, two, three days, every leader has to define themselves in three photos. They're not allowed to use a photo of their pet, and they're not allowed to use a photo of their kids or their immediate loved ones. So it has to be a bit, um, those are very deep and significant things, but it, we have to go beyond that, that kind of level. So these are my three, uh, me in corporate, me on my 50th and my defining moment, and then my, my grandfather. This is a photo of my grandfather. My grandfather was a stable boy in a big country house in England. He left school at 12. He lived in the stables with the horses. And then he got promoted to be the, uh, the butler's assistant. Anyone in the room who's watched Downton Abbey, you kind of get a sense of, of what I'm talking about. That's my grandfather, top left, standing next to the, uh, the house butler. And uh, he died on the 21st of uh, December, 1983. But just before he died, I was, I was only you know, 16, 17. And I, was, I was a bit young to really absorb all of his teachings. Um, but he instilled in me the basics of business. And I don't care how much the world is driven by technology. I think these are the basic principles of business. And, you know, he taught me that relationships are the foundation of everything. He taught me to live life with a servant's heart, to live life with a generous heart, to live life with gratitude, to always do people a good turn, to never worry if you're going to get it back or not. And essentially, you know, the, the flip that I made in, in, in my life was I used to go into one-to-one -one with someone on my team thinking, what can I get from this person? How can I get more performance from this person? Or I used to go to a meeting with a client or a supplier uh, or, or anyone else in business, a stakeholder in the bank, and I used to think, what can I get from this person? It's only when I really, really thought about my grandfather's teachings that I realized I had to go into every con uh, conversation, every interaction, thinking, what can I give to this person? And the, the moment I made that switch, my business performance just never stopped improving. What can I give to this person as opposed to what can I get from this person? By giving first, I found I got a lot more. All of that came from my grandfather's teachings. The only practical thing he ever taught me was never make a decision when you're tired. He says things will always look better in the morning. And I fundamentally subscribe to that. And I would add to that in this day and age, never send an email when you're tired. You know, once, and I used to say to my team the whole time, every single email you send, see it on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald. Once it's out there, it's out there. You know, and I'd say even more than that, and I used to say this and I still say this, is you certainly never post on social media when you're tired and or drunk. I mean, we are our personal brand 
you know, you are your personal brand. People are looking at you all of the time. Hopefully not from the perspective that Jonathan was coming to, but they're looking at you the whole time. You are your personal brand, you know. Never send an email when, you, when you're tired. Never make a key decision when you're tired. And certainly never post on social media when you're tired and or drunk. And just before he died, my grandfather left me with this. And, and some people told me this is a Jewish proverb. Some people said this is an Indian proverb, but it's not Mahatma Gandhi's. My grandfather's teachings was that it was Gandhi's, and, that, and that's the way I've kept it. And um, as you said, Mark, you know, this is the way that I, I live my life. You know, I had no shoes and complained until I met a man with no feet. You know, my grandfather, he didn't come from anything, but he said, we are so privileged, we are so fortunate. You know, your, your responsibility, your accountability is to live life as an optimist, to, to live life with a positive, can-do, customer-driven attitude. You know, and I, I used to get the, the ferry to work in this amazing city uh, when I was in corporate every single day, and I'd be on the ferry listening to people moaning that, it was slightly too hot, it was slightly too cold, it was slightly too windy. Oh my God, it's raining today, it's the end of the world. And then I'd get into my big corporate tower and again, you just hear people moaning about stuff that is irrelevant and doesn't really matter. And the way I live my life, and you know, I fundamentally believe you become the sum of the seven people you spend most time with. You know, I have no time in my life for anyone who brings any negativity. I'm a fundamental believer that winners go to winners and losers go to losers, like goes to like and you've got to pick your company really carefully. You know, and that goes to the closest people to you. you know, it's amazing how many people get squashed by people who should be there to, to lift them up and support them you know, and, and, and help them live true to their true potential. So I believe there are four types of people in the world. There are players, there are victims, there are cynics, and there are spectators. What do you hear from the mouth of a victim? It's not fair. I call it the poor me syndrome. In fact, the first time I did this, I was using butcher's paper and and this guy jumped up, he was sitting uh, about where Chris is in the front row. Um, I'm, I'm now an Aussie, but I'm also a palm, and I was English, this guy was Scottish. He jumped up and he grabbed a pen. He says, it's not poor me. He goes, it's poor old me. And then he went, P-O-M, pom. <laughs> anyway, I fired him. Um, <laughs> there are victims, there are cynics. And the cynics is, you know, it's easier for them. That'll not work for us. They've got amazing clients, you know, we haven't. You know, we've tried it before, you know, it's never gonna work. You know, you just hear it time after time after time after time. And when they see someone who's doing something exceptionally well, they put it down to one of three things. They say they're lucky, which it never is. They say the boss favors them over me. Maybe the case, normally isn't the case. Or they say they're somehow cheating or getting around the system. Occasionally may be the case, but frequently isn't. Instead of looking at them like that US salesperson going, what can I learn from this person? They'll just talk away their success. Most people live life in the middle lane. Most people are spectators. They'll watch and see, they'll wait. They won't take any risks. They'll never put their head above the parapet. An opportunity will just pass them by and then they'll get to the Tony Robbins test and go, shit, you know, I've not lived a life anywhere near true to my, my potential because I've just been too, um, too wait and see, too risk averse, you know. And then there are players, which is everything I've described up until this point. But unfortunately, life isn't as easy as that. You're not either a player, a victim, a cynic, or a spectator. There's a bit of that in each and every one of us. And I truly believe if you want to live the life that you're capable of and build the team that you're capable of, then you've got to catch yourself. If ever you catch yourself thinking, acting, or speaking like a victim, a cynic, or a spectator, you've got to get yourself back into the player mode before anyone on your team sees you in any one of those other states. You know, and, and again, when I was talking to my bank managers, I'd always say, the way you come in is the way they go out. You set the tone and you can reset the tone on a daily basis. And so think about that really, really carefully. So set you know, a positive, can-do, action-orientated, optimistic tone. If you slip into victim, cynic, or spectator, everyone boss watches. Everyone watches the business owner. If you go there, they'll go there. You know? And you may get yourself out of there a lot quicker than they'll get themselves out of there. And it's a hell of a lot harder for you to get them out of there if you've let them go there in the first place. And early in my career, I, I watched this video by the Harvard Business School. And I didn't think it was, it was heavy, 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 but uh, the core principles were amazing. And in this time in the UK, we used to think the most important people in business um, were our customers. And this changed the whole thinking to say the most important people in business are not customers, it's those that serve customers. You know, those at the front end of any business. Those who are facing in, you know, to the owners and to the tenants and to everyone else. It's, it's, it's the front end of the business. Those are the people that are the most important and often the most forgotten in any business. 
So I changed that, that Harvard business case study into four words, morale, service, sales, winning. And I'd go around my branches, this was in Sheffield in England, and I'd say, what's the most important word on that board? You know, and when we started, everyone would go sales, 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 sales. I'd say, no, the most important word on that board by a mile is the top word. I knew my job as a leader, and I believe your job as a leader, a business owner, is to make sure everyone in your business comes to work every day with a smile on their face, with a positive can-do, customer-driven attitude, a high level of self-belief, a high level of self-confidence. You know, you cannot deliver exceptional service if everyone in your business is miserable. Your industry will be disrupted as, it, as will every other industry across Australia. You know, and one of your key differentiators will be your ability to deliver exceptional service. You can't do that with miserable people. It's simple, simple stuff. You know, a high level of morale will drive a better level of service. No one in this room can tell me you can sell consistently off the back of poor service. I don't believe you. Service has to come before sales. In fact, the higher the level of service you offer, people buy, you know, people, you sell less because people buy more. They essentially become your raving fans. And they just talk, they just move around your communities talking about you. So your morale improves, your service will improve. If your service improves, your sales will improve. If your sales and service improve, you win things. If you win things, your morale improves. And that is the virtuous circle, which I took through every business I ever had the privilege of leading over 25 years or so. You know, and, and when I had that in the UK, I had risk and integrity in the middle. When I moved to Australia, I took it out because I didn't think we needed it. Uh, over the last couple of years, when I started here about a Royal Commission, I put it back in um, just in case I was ever up in front of them. But if you listen to what Jonathan was saying, my God, if you don't get your risk settings right, if people don't operate with integrity, and most of the fraud in my bank was actually driven internally. Um, I hate to say it, but that was the case. You know, if you don't get your, your, your risk settings right, if you don't get integrity in your business, you don't do anything else. You just sort that stuff out all day long. So that's a virtuous circle of uh, business I'd, I'd ask you to think about. I'd also ask you to think about this. This is my most important quote, and I think this is so relevant for every industry. Um, you know, and if you think about Kodak, the digital camera put Kodak out of business. Not many people realize that Kodak invented the digital camera that put Kodak out of business. Why? Because they were so focused on their one revenue stream or their major revenue stream, which was film. And there was so much resistance to change within Kodak, they kept this thing pushed to one side, they kept pushing it to one side. They were so busy climbing the ladder, climbing the ladder, climbing the ladder. You know, and I see it with some of the insurance business businesses here that one of their major product lines has been you know, credit card insurance and suddenly it's, it's being pulled, it's being pulled, it's being pulled you know, as the Royal Commission kind of gets hold. And, and they're so busy climbing that, that ladder that the wall's moved and they've not even realized. You know, and I think that'd be true in your industry. And I talk to all of my clients about, you know, particularly the business owners, you've got to be able to operate at 100 foot as well as six foot. Six foot is when you're down in amongst it and in small businesses, you've got to do the do. I absolutely recognize that. You've got to have the ability to get up to 100 foot and, and think about where your industry is going, think about where the business is going, and think about the fact, is your ladder solely placed against one wall, or you're even considering some of the other walls that are out there, and, and how do you switch and stay ahead of the curve? So very, very briefly, um, I threw this in, because um, we're in Darling Harbour. Uh, this was in Darling Harbour. Um, most people, in my view, um, are capable of way more than what they allow themselves to, to believe they are. You know, and um, you've got someone who, who can do 20 of whatever it is, and you work with them to set a goal, and they say, I'll go for 30. And yet you get someone else who says, well, I'll go for 100. You know, and most people's minds are wired to say, if they go for 30 and they get 31, that's success. I'm wired to say, if you go for 100 and you get 75, that is a massive success. You know, you've got to be able to think big. As Michelangelo said, you know, the risk for most of us is not that we set the bar too high and we miss it, we set the bar too low and we hit it. So you have to have that ability to think big. And this is one of my proudest moments when I ran St. George, is we decided we'd sell this enormous green dragon into Darling Harbour and park it up just down there. And obviously, as you know, CBA headquarters is just here and then Westpac's headquarters is just back there. And um, we went in front of the executive of the bank and um, we told them about this idea. And, they, and we literally had this wall of people looking a bit like you guys, actually. No, no, that is a stupid idea. That is the most stupid idea I've ever heard. No, you will never make that happen. You know, and this is my problem with most people, that they get a, a degree of rejection or knockback, and they just stop. You know, and I believe you can make impossible things happen. 
as long as you've got that level of self-belief, that level of self-confidence, that ability to persevere and keep going. So as you can see, we sailed this enormous green dragon into Darling Harbour, and um, you know we, we got lucky. Uh, it was the Moon Festival, uh, and obviously Haymarket's just down there, as we all know, and the Chinese community and the harbour authorities played for all the fireworks. And this was a massive play, actually. It was an internal play to my people, because you know, when I took over St. George, we were on the decline. You know, our people lacked belief, they lacked confidence, they lacked self-esteem. Everything was tired about the business. And I wanted the people to put their shoulders back and have pride in the, in the dragon. So we just kind of sailed this whole thing in there. But also, it was one of our biggest um, campaigns on social media. And people say, this must have been expensive. This is not expensive. TV is expensive. Radio is expensive. This was um, cheap as chips. And, you know, it went viral on social media. Chinese, as we know, love their dragons. It was Moon Festival. They paid for the fireworks. This thing just went off, you know. People often say to me, how did you get this round Westpac, who obviously owns St. George? We just didn't tell them. <laughs> so you've got to understand the risk of winning. Um, a couple of other things about goals. I'd love to talk to you about goals all day. But, you know, first of all, I'd love you to think about, you know, just scaling your business, you know, thinking big about your business. But then most people, big dreams just stay as big dreams. And, and why is that? It's because people cannot break it down. You know, and, and I worked with Kerry Potthurst a couple of times who's, um, you know, she won gold at the Sydney Olympics for beach volleyball. And um, Kerry actually was a hard court volleyball player and she smashed her body to pieces and was told she'd never play volleyball again. And yet she had this big dream that she was gonna win gold for Australia at the Sydney Olympics at beach volleyball. And um, she says to you, if you wanna become a brilliant goal setter, what you've gotta do is have a massive goal, but then break it down and find some emotional attachment to the goal. So she said, there's, you know, there's nothing that's more meaningful to a volleyball player than a volleyball. And all she did was write one goal, short-term goal on each panel of the volleyball. And she said, all you've got to do is focus on your next best action. So in January 93, all I've got to do is run in the water. In February 93, all I've got to do is jump on the spot. In March 93, all I've got to do is my, ride my bike. She said, that's how you do it. You set an enormous goal and then you just break it down to the, your next best action and you just purely focus on that, you know? And um, top right is my, uh, is my screensaver. And I like to involve my kids in absolutely everything I do. And um, this was designed by my 12-year-old daughter and I told her about a project I've got um, called 2025. And um, when she designed it, I said, Lucy, why did you pick that as my screensaver? And she said, well, first of all, Dad, if they can do that, you can do every, anything. And this is what, you know, I wake up and when I turn on my laptop every single day, that's why it goes through my mind. If they can do that, you can do anything. So I believe great goal setters, you know, they break their big goals down as Kerry's done, but then they put things in front of them each and every day that just remind them of who they are and what they're about. And then she said, Dad, she didn't use the word, she said they've got every reason to be a victim, a cynic or a spectator. And yet look at them. They're so happy in doing what they're doing. And then finally, I, everywhere I go, I carry a rhino and a Yoda. You know, my two little symbols, these are my reminders of to, to keep going, keep going, keep going. You know, great goal setters, they have ways of persevering when most people stop. Yoda, there is no try, do or do not. And the rhino is something I'd love to talk about on a different day. It takes longer than 30 seconds, but it's, it's just a mechanism for keeping going. You know, and, and most achievers in life, they just keep going when most other people stop. And I believe that has got so much difference between the successful and otherwise. It's about how you get up every time you fall. So in conclusion, conclusion, just a couple of things from me. Um, I said to you right at the start that I moved to Australia um, with three quarters of my children. Uh, I left my boy behind uh, from my first marriage. And um, actually, I've just been back to England. He just turned 18. Uh, surprised him. He didn't know I was coming. It was just phenomenal. In fact, the first time I showed this one actually said, uh, why did you stand in a hole to have that photo? Um, <laughs> he's got his height from his, his mother's side of the family, not me. And uh, I, look at that, I look at a photo of my son every single day. And again, if you can put something in front of your face every single day where there's a massive emotional attachment, whatever it is, you will find another gear. You will drive yourself way beyond. You know, you will build the best law firm in Australia. You'll, you'll be part of the best insurance business in Australia. You know, you'll take your property management business to a different scale than you, even you think you're capable of taking it, you know. And um, I just say to myself, I didn't phrase this very well. I should have said I came here to be exceptional. You know, we made that decision to move to Australia with three quarters of our children and we left our son in England. If you can make that decision, you can make any decision in business. No decision is difficult. But I look at that photo every single day and I say, look, I didn't come here to be average. I owe it to him. 
I owe it to his sisters, I owe it to myself, I owe it to my wife. You know, it drives me, you know, beyond um, anything that, you know, a target would drive me or anything else. If you can put something that really grips you emotionally, why you're doing what you're doing in front of you on a daily basis, it might be a property, you know, um, you know, in Byron Bay or whatever it is, something that's emotionally attached, you'll go so much further than you think you're going. And I'll end with this story and it kind of sums up the way that I am. And uh, it's a text exchange with my youngest daughter, Lily. Uh, all my kids are just every, involved in absolutely everything I do. And uh, we'd just come back from Las Vegas. My wife and I have been over there for a conference. Um, we've been traveling nonstop. We've been on Qantas. You know, I love red wine. It's, oh, I never have a drink when I'm speaking, so I've been watching everyone just enjoying their red wine. It's been driving me mad. So we, we'd had way too much red wine. We got in. My mother-in-law was over from Scotland. She'd let the kids stay up late. We're in our bedroom, it's 10 o'clock. Lily, the little one, she's listening to the conversation between myself and my wife. My wife says, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, I've got a really ugly day tomorrow. It's the quarterly business review. That's when I go in front of the board of the bank and I have to present my business for a couple of hours and, and basically just get fired questions. And, and you know, it's a really a wonderful process. And then you get out and you get on with, with running the business. And um, I said, it's gonna be a really ugly day. I'm tired, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I'm on the ferry the next morning and I get this text. Hi, Daddy, I miss you so much. Every single day when my daughter leaves for school, she's now nine, all I say is B. All I say is B, and she goes, amazing. And you go, my God, you're some psycho conditioning dad. Yes, I absolutely am. I absolutely am. You, you walk out on these streets, and you'll hear parents saying to their kids, you are stupid, you're thick, you're this, you're that, you're the... And I go, my God, what are you doing? I hear it every single day. You know? And they look at the stats, and the number of times kids hear the word no versus yes by the time they're 16, it will blow your mind. You know, so you see these kids with massive potential who by the time they're 16, they're a shell of themselves. Mainly because of the conditioning, as people say at school, it's actually closer to home than that, in my opinion. So I go B and she goes amazing. Every single day she leaves that house and she feels full of opportunity, full of potential, full of confidence, full of belief, because I put it back into that. I put it into it. Daddy, I miss you so much. Be amazing. She's seven years old, she's playing it back to me. Be amazing at work today. Forget about an ugly day, think of a happy day. Love you lots and lots, see you soon, Lily. My kids are amazing, she's only seven, I assume this is my wife, pretending to be Lily. So I think I'll play along. I will think happy, thanks for the coaching moment, Lily. So she comes back, seven years old. It's okay, I remember you saying you were having an ugly day today last night. Life is too short to have ugly days, can't wait to see you tonight. And uh, she ends with the guns emoji. And my, my nephew lives on the Gold Coast, and this is when I knew it was her. My nephew lives on the Gold Coast and he's absolutely ripped. And Lily's always saying to me, Dad, how come Scott's got amazing guns and you've got absolutely none? And then she pays me out in every text with the emoji. And that's what, I'll just leave you to think about that. You know, um, life is too short to have ugly days. You know, if you want to build the world's best business, the state's best business, the best business in property management, you know, life is short and it certainly is too short to have ugly days. So thank you very much and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, mate.